Hey everybody, welcome to my session from Zero to Deep Learning. I am really excited to be here and thanks to the J Future organizers to, uh, for setting this up and, and for having me. My name is Fabio Tiritico. Um, my uh, handle everywhere on GitHub and Twitter is TicoFab. It's, it's a lot easier to pronounce than my family name. And uh, I have just one word of caution before we start this presentation. Uh, this really is an introduction from zero to deep learning. So we go all, we you know, from zero, from scratch, the basic concepts of deep learning. And there is going to be some code at the end, but this really is an introduction for uh, those who don't know deep learning yet. So if you are a deep learning expert already, this talk might not be the place for you. But if otherwise you are uh, intrigued by deep learning, but maybe never took the time to uh, figure out how it works, then this is the perfect place for you. So let's get started. I come from Italy, but I live in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, since uh, more than 10 years, where I work as a software engineer, but also as a community manager. I am the founder and I run the Reactive Amsterdam Meetup community. And I'm also one of the organizers of the Kubernetes Community Days conference, which, yeah, unfortunately this year because of COVID, we decided to, to in fact, cancel and postpone to 2021, which uh, again, for me is one more reason to be thankful to the J Future organizers because um, I know how much work it is to organize an online event. So uh, yeah, once again, kudos to them. So this is more or less who I am. Now let's get into this talk. The entire talk is based on an idea that involves planes. And why is that? So um, about a year and a half ago, when it still was possible to work in offices, I used to work in an office next to the Amsterdam airport called Schiphol. And what you see on screen now is in fact a section of Google Maps centered on the airport. Now, the section of this map that I just highlighted is the original airport area, the one that was first built more than 100 years ago. As traffic grew over time, there was a need to expand the airport area, so building other airstrips. And in particular, this one was built. Now, the problem was that in the meantime, you see that yellow um, yellow sort of uh, street in the, in the middle, there is a highway that was, that was there already. Now, so what was the solution that they figured out to uh, connect the two airstrip? Well, simply build a bridge over the highway, just plain bridge. And so as a result, I'm sure if you have driven around that area, you have noticed how impressive it is. The view from my office windows was this one. Every now and then you would see these massive planes just strolling peacefully over this bridge, just meters above these tiny, tiny cars and people passing under it. So it, it was a very exciting view. Uh, yeah, again, especially when you have these huge planes. And so there was only one problem. If you wanted to take a picture of this, you had to rely on luck because you don't know when these planes are passing by. So here my idea came to be. I am going to put a Raspberry Pi in front of the window with a camera module that takes pictures of the bridge all the time and train a neural network to be able to tell me whether in the picture that the Raspberry Pi just took, there is a plane on the bridge or not. And if there is a plane, I'm going to tweet that picture because you, you, you want to do something with it. So, um, this was the setup that I got. So you see the Raspberry Pi uh, uh, just here and taking pictures of the bridge at the end of the road. In, in this case, there's actually a plane on the bridge. And the kind of pictures that it, the Raspberry Pi would take look like the ones on the right, where on the top picture, there is a plane on the bridge, whereas on the bottom picture, there is no plane on the bridge. I built this thing and then eventually I started tweeting the pictures on this Twitter account, Planes on Bridge. Um, it was pretty funny to see over time how season changed and, uh, and it was pretty beautiful. 
Um, I had 17 followers, so maybe not the most popular Twitter account out there, but uh, still some friends and family decided to follow it. And now the, I tweeted about 1,100 pictures in total. Um, I, I don't do this anymore, unfortunately. Well, I don't work there anymore, but plus I don't think that in these COVID times we would see a lot of planes passing by anyway. So Now, one word to be said, I could have chosen to use one of the cloud offerings from machine learning and image recognition in general, but what would be the fun of it? I mean, we are here for the purpose of learning new things. And so here we go. Deep learning, what is it? Deep learning really is a subset of machine learning, which is in turn a subset of this general concept of artificial intelligence. And machine learning and deep learning have, in fact, uh, two specific cases about making prediction about the data that they have not seen yet. So making prediction about new data is the, is the specific use case for machine learning and deep learning. And in fact, there's two common cases, two common uses of this prediction. One kind of prediction is called regression. And regression basically answers the question, how much? So the graph that you see here, um, this, this line here, um, we are basically trying to predict, given a set of points, what is a function that approximates them best. Uh, in this case, it would be a linear function called linear regression. And, you know, it could be anything, maybe, a, I don't know, these points could represent the price of a house uh, for sale, given its square meters. Um, and so in general, you try to answer the question, how much, what would be the price of this house given these square meters? And the other use case is classification, which answers the question, what kind? The, the, the example, um, that you see uh, in, 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 the, in the picture is that famous experiment that someone did about training a deep learning network to distinguish between a, a chihuahua or a raspberry muffin. And I have to say, it's not, it's not that easy. I, some, some of those muffins, they, they are quite tricky, even for me to, to tell apart from, from chihuahua faces. So um, yes. Uh, we have these two use cases, regression and classification. In our case, uh, it's a classic classification use case where we are classifying between two different classes, two different plus possible outcomes. One class is there is a plane and the other class is there is no plane. So before we show the working of this, we need to understand how neural networks are built. And in fact, the basic unit of any neural network is the artificial neuron. It's called like this because it's modeled after the neurons that we all have in our brains. Um, we humans and animals alike. Um, and, and what is it? Well, at the mo in the most basic uh, definition, a neuron is a function, a mathematical function called transfer function that operates on a set of inputs, um, weight inputs. So each input is weight with these different weights that in this case are named W1, W2, all the way to Wn. Now, the output of the transfer function called res in this graph actually gets put through another function, which in practice is just a filter. Um, the activation function is, is a filter that decides whether to propagate the result of the transfer function or not. So in practice, the, the, the filter could decide something like, you know, maybe based on the value of the transfer function, I decide whether to propagate it, and so the, the global output of the neuron would be that value, or not propagate it, in which case the output of the neuron would be zero. That's all. It's basically two mathematical functions, out of which one is very, very simple, it's just a filter. 
This is the artificial neuron in its core. And then you might be wondering, well, this doesn't look very powerful, does it? And, and that's correct. The real power of neural networks come indeed when these networks are composed by many, many, many neurons. So this is a general schema of a neural network. What you have, if you read it from left to, to the right, you have some output in, input values, which are now, now covered by my head. Actually, I should be able to disappear somehow. Now, well, you have, well, anyway, there it is. On the left, you have some input values. These input values get fed into the, the neurons of the first layer, the input layer. What this layer does is it usually, um, each neuron of the input layer just propagates further the information that it gets fed to. So it propagates the inputs to all the layers in the first hidden layer. The neurons in the hidden layer will apply their mathematical functions and use their filters. And so some of them will propagate some information to the second hidden layer. And the process is repeated throughout all these hidden layers all the way down to the output layer. The output layer, those neurons that you see, are tasked with the task of receiving the input from the last hidden layer and sort of collapse it down to some output values that we want to see. Um, let, let's see in practice, for instance, we could do, let's say the inputs are A, B, and C. Well, the input layer is going to propagate these inputs to all the neurons in the first hidden layer. And then maybe this will happen. As you can see, through the hidden layers, only some of the neurons propagate the result of their function. And in this case, for instance, the output, will, the output values will be two and five. Now, if on the left, just here, I change the input values into T, P, and G, we'll have that the, the, the input layer is going to propagate this information all the, the, to all the neurons in the hidden layer. And then the hidden layer, well, will, will be the same as before. Some neurons, based on the results on their functions, will propagate information and maybe not. And at the end, the output layers will produce a result of seven and two. And so as you can see, the combinations are almost infinite. And as, as if you add more layers and you add more neurons per layer than just four, you have these incredible combinations of possibilities. And, and this is actually the reason why these layers are called hidden and, and why these kind of neural networks are called deep learning. Because it, for us humans, Imagine when you have like hundreds of neurons per each layer, or maybe thousands. For us humans, it's very, very difficult to understand what's going on in there. So deep is this idea where the computational possibilities are so many that it's difficult for us to grasp. Okay, this is the basic, you know, a basic structure of every neural network. Now, at some point you want to, to start using it. And, and, and so how should I build my neural network? How many neurons, how many layers? Well, this is the first revelation on the path of learning deep learning, uh, of learning what deep learning and neural networks are. That at this point in time in history, tuning an AI network means basically trial and error. So there is no way from you know before to deterministically decide how many neurons how many layers are you going to need? We know that there are some architectures, so some specific networks that work better than others for solving a specific category of problems. But that's all we know. So if you want to solve a problem of image recognition, for instance, you know that there's some architectures that work well, so you start with something that is proven to work well, and then you tune it. To your own need, hoping that you will find the, the the some correct values. 
Now, what are the most important architectures that we know of? If we try and match problems with type of deep network, deep networks, well, the probably one of the most important nowadays important network architecture is the so-called convolutional neural network or CNN. And the typical use case is image recognition. These kind of networks are really good once trained to tell one image from another one. They, they, they can recognize faces, animals, uh, street signs, everything. Uh, if you take a product like a Tesla, a Tesla is probably full of convolutional neural networks. Each one may be specific for each uh, thing that the car needs to recognize. Uh, maybe there's one for a traffic light, there's one for you know signals, there's one for speed limits or whatever, there's a network for uh, that, that, that sees what other cars are doing and so forth. The Another very important use case is recurrent neural networks or RNN. These networks are really good in processes where the inputs form sequences in time what does it mean where where the one input that you see at a certain time is very correlated to the inputs that preceded it or the input that came after it so for instance a sentence in a sentence um, the meaning of a single word is probably related to the meaning of the word before and after or in general to the context of that sentence so these networks are very complicated and they are best used in, the, in speech synthesis or speech recognition. Uh, so products like Google Home or uh, you know Alexa from Amazon, um, they make big use of the recurrent neural networks. And there's other networks, arch network architectures as well, but we'll just uh, mention these two for now. And obviously for this one project here, we're going to try and build a convolutional neural network because we are looking for planes on a bridge. All right, now let's have a little deeper look at convolutional neural networks in particular. And to understand their power, I would like to ask you everybody to look at this image for one second. Okay, now my question is, how long did it take for you to tell which one was the rabbit and which one was the cat. I'm pretty sure that your brain knew exactly. In one second, less, milliseconds, you just knew immediately. You didn't have to think about it. Just by looking at this image, you knew which one was the rabbit and which one was the cat. Now, if you try and break down the process of your brain, though, what, what would it look like? It would maybe look like something. Oh, both animals have a black and white fur. Both animals have a nose and they have two eyes and four legs and so on. But one of them has longer ears and one of them has the eyes right in the middle, whereas the other animals has the eyes on the side. Uh, one animal probably has a longer tail and so your brain put together all this information, similarities and differences and very quickly told you what, which one is the rabbit and which one is the cat. Now, this is exactly where the power of convolutional neural network is. If you were to tell a computer, right, to write an algorithm that tells apart rabbits from cats, if you try to do that, you would realize that it would be really, really difficult. Um, and the power of convolutional neural networks is, is right here. These networks are able to understand, learn the important features that make a rabbit a rabbit and a cat a cat without us, human, specifically telling it what to look for. Now, how does this process work? We're gonna see it in the next slide. If you have thousands and thousands of images of rabbits, and what you can do is label them 
So let's say I have images labeled as there is a rabbit here and images labeled as there is no rabbit here. Now the network during the training phase will apply to each image a grid like the one that you see here. There it is. This, this grid here behind me. Um, imagine if you imagine this grid as a of course as a pixel level this network is is really looking at each pixel of the image and through the training of a lot of images the network learns what kind of filters it needs to look at this image through to understand whether there's a rabbit or not I know what I said that that doesn't make a lot of sense for us but just know again that with training the network identifies filters that when these filters are applied to an image when you look at an image through this filter the network is able to tell whether there is a rabbit or not and in fact fi these filters they mean tuning the weights on the transfer function of each artificial neuron each one of them tuning each one of them each weight of each neuron that we uh, uh, you know by using thousands and thousands of images as training set will end up with a set of weights that embed these kinds of filter and this is I, I, I don't think I can say I can say it in a, in a, in a more simple way than this. Um, what you need is, is a lot of classified image, images, so a lot of images labeled uh, accordingly. And what, so if we try and map this concept to a actual network, it would look like something like this. A typical convolutional neural network architecture if you remember the the the, the typical new network from earlier this network given an input an image from the left there will be an input layer that propagates the Im information from the image followed by a convolutional layer now this layer of neurons is the neuron is the layer of the neurons that are trained with the filters and um, this convolutional layer, the information that comes out of the, all the transfer functions of all the neurons is passed down to a subsampling layer, which is just a sort of bandwidth reducer. It will just half or reduce somehow the information coming from the convolutional layer. And after this information will be passed to a dense layer, a 500, for instance, fully connected neurons which then will talk to an output layer whose output will be yes there is uh, in in our case a plane or not or there is a rabbit or not this is a typical convolutional neural network architecture and this network is exactly what we are going to build right now with deep learning for j um, deep learning for j just a couple of words is a framework to build neural networks um, there's another one very famous called TensorFlow, um, probably the most famous one actually, that one, uh, sponsored by Google. Um, I tried it and personally I didn't like it very much because the Java APIs felt sort of an addition, whereas the library is uh, maybe more built for Python. Um, so in Deep Learning for J, which is a project, a project under the Eclipse wing, I felt right at home. and. Uh, the Java APIs are, 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 are much nicer. So feel free to try both, but I recommend Deep Learning for J. Now, how, how are we going to do about that? Well, once we have all these images, you know, that my Raspberry Pi has taken of uh, the bridge with planes or no planes, what we need to do is, first of all, an intelligent thing is to crop them I am only interested in planes on the bridge. I'm not interested in, in cars or building around it. So any more information is just noise, if you want. Also, we are going to scale it down to 100, well, in this case, 171 times 25 pixels. 
um, is uh, it's a bit of a random number it doesn't really matter what it is but the point is that if you look at the image on the right you can totally see that there is a plane so the basic features of a plane say uh, a tail the head this long shape those are kept and so storing images like that takes obviously less space but it's also faster to read and speeds up training um, you know remember that your network needs to be trained with thousands and thousands of information uh, of, of images once we have done this with all our images we can split the data set in two um, if you look at these images that you see classified labeled images with plane or no plane on the other side then this entire data set we're going to split it in two subsets one called the training set which will be 80% of your images and the other one will be a test set a test set is important you're, because you're not going to use it during the training phase we are only going to use the training set and when the training is finished you are going to test the network on the test set which are images that the network has not seen before to see how it behaves if it's able to tell images where there is a plane on the bridge or not now we have our data set we labeled all the images we split it into training set and test set time to start writing some code um, first of all we need to write some some settings such as the input height uh, the input width this is the pixels in our images the depth um, in this case is three because it corresponds to the number of input channels so each pixel will have uh, three input input channels three colors uh, a red value a green and a blue value and settings like the number of possible outcomes for instance uh, the, in this case two possible uh, classes plane or no plane so lots of settings like this and then we are finally ready to start building our network now in this slide i am going to show the code for each of the layers that we see there at the bottom and on one side of the slide you will have the complete code of the network the way you know it looks like when it's completed all right let's start with of course a builder new neural net configuration builder and then second step we add the input layer so we set that the input type will be a convolutional layer passing in the information of the images about the images that it will receive so height width and depth depth and then we add the first layer a convolutional layer now what you see there i have a new convolutional layer dot builder and that builder has a number five and five what is that well five and five is the dimension of the grid that i told you about earlier so what it means is that the network during training phase will scan all these images using a grid five by five and then later you see there is a stride one and one one and one are it means one pixel by one pixel so the network will use a five by five pixel grid moving by one pixel at a time up and down to scan through the entire image and it will do so for all the training images that it receives and in this process it will train and tune the weights on the neurons that compose the convolutional layer this, this is the most important piece of our architecture. After this, we're gonna add a subsampling layer, that one. As you can see, kernel size two, two, and stride two, two. That simply means that we are going to half down the bandwidth of the information coming from the previous layer. And after that, we are going to add a dense layer, 500, simply fully connected neurons and 
finally we add the output layer which needs to output two possible classes plane or no plane and build the entire thing so as you can see if I get out a little bit of the way the on the left you have the entire neural network configuration and one word of disclaimer if you were to copy and paste the code from the slides it would not compile this is simplified code for the purposes of this presentation but later I have a link to my repository on github with the actual real code that, that I have used but this is about it you can see a very clear uh, correspondence between the layers and the code and I thought that this was really helpful I, I really liked the way that deep learning is specialized it, it, you know it, the way it, it, it really goes into this kind of detail all right so um, I had in mind to do a live demo and, and run this on a Raspberry Pi but on we, we are on remote and so this is a screenshot is what we get this is what training your network looks like if you see above here there's different lines and there's different epochs so epoch really means an iteration of a training what the network will do is for a certain amount of time which in in this case i limited at six minutes for six minutes th the network will go over all the images in multiple iterations and for each iteration it will train from scratch its neurons and then use the test set to calculate a score to see how each iteration performs now the um, the the score that you see for instance maybe I can try and highlight it a little bit um, the score that you see here 0 0.897 is the score of the first iteration for each iteration will have a different score and the network will only keep the best one so if we go through these entire iterations then we see that the best one is which one is probably this one here 0 0.9616 this is the best score so when the training stops because time ran out this is the configuration that will be saved for your neurons this is it now how does the model perform then in real life this is the confusion matrix and this one way to see how your network performs every time that the network sees one image and makes a prediction says for instance uh, there is a plane or there is no plane you can classify this outcome into this into one of these four quadrants uh, so from the top left it could be a true positive that means that there was a plane on the image and the model saw it correctly but below it it could be a false positive the model saw a plane but in fact there wasn't any a false positive conversely we could have a false negative where the plane was actually there but the model did not see it and finally a true negative which means that there was no plane and the model didn't see one so if you look at the you know outcome of the prediction of your network and then you look at the image then you can you can evaluate where it where it falls and if i look at how my network behaved for instance it's going to look something like this out of the uh, the confusion matrix that we have just seen there's two very important measurements that we can um, extrapolate one of them which in this graph is the uh, blue line is called the precision precision tells us how well our network avoids false positives the other one is called recall and recall which here is a red line tells us how well our network avoids false negatives so 
we can see that the precision most days is pretty good. These values can be between 0 and 1 and the precision in some days is 1. So perfect. It means that when the network tells me that there is a plane in the image, there is. The recall though it's not very good. It oscillates up, up and down, but it's mostly pretty average or bad. What does it mean? That the model is not so good at avoiding false negatives. In other words, it often misses a lot of planes. So when there is a plane, when the network tells that there is a plane, there is one, very likely. But sometimes there is a plane on the bridge and the network does not see it and you know you in fact part of the tuning that i was talking about before is deciding what you want to network to be good at everything is a compromise like in you know in in most things that we do in in our profession everything is a compromise and so you you, you need to decide whether you want your network uh, to be yeah maybe very good in one uh, measure or very good or in one other depending on your field for instance let's say you you are training a network to diagnose um, patients in a hospital uh, you know maybe tell if maybe they have cancer or not well in that case you definitely don't want to have any false negative uh, maybe better to scare someone with a false positive and then do further tests to check then have false negatives where you would have a patient that has potential cancer but your model says there is no problem that is something that you absolutely want to avoid in that situation so it really depends on the situation so in the end my my model did, did quite well uh, on some days but recall wasn't very good um, on, on most days and, and in fact if I go and look back at the images why is that well the Netherlands is not a is not a country famous for sunny weather and and in fact the weather is the reason why it went wrong most of the time if you look at the top uh, left image there it's, it's very very foggy and so that confused the network in another image is raining um, just to the right of it so uh, all the drops of water on the window confuse the image, confuse the, sorry, confuse the Raspberry Pi, the network. On this top left image, uh, the sun is just in front of the camera, so the contrast is very high and the colors are all, it's very dark. It, actually, if you squint, um, there, there is a plane, I think right here, if you squint, you're, uh, but it's very difficult to see it. Uh, and finally, very interested, in, very interesting in in, in in the in the image right there. That's another problem uh, that makes us appreciate the power of our brain. Uh, for us, it's obvious that there is a plane in that picture, but in fact, it's only a partial image of a plane because the head is missing. You see the tail, the engine, the wing, and maybe this is enough to confuse. A neural network a neural network maybe needs to have some specific reference and so a, an image of a plane without a head or without a tail it could be very confusing um, and I don't know one of the side effects for me of, of this this adventure with deep learning is uh, realizing and appreciating how powerful our brain is really um, well I'm almost done um, there's only one other thing that I wanted to mention a bit briefly, but another issue that my network had with, with you know, recognizing planes is actually AI bias. Because I am based in the Netherlands and the national air company is called KLM and its planes are blue. That means that most of the images that I used to train my network display blue planes so in other words if you train a network in Amsterdam 
it will think that all planes are blue. And so in practice, when using it on images that it never seen before, it would look at an image with a blue plane and say, oh yeah, of course there's a plane, very easy to spot. But when there is a plane of a different color, say white, or there's a planes from DHL that are yellow, the network would have a lot more trouble seeing that there is a plane. And I have to say, this hit me like a wall. I really did not expect this to happen in, in such a you know playful project, just to learn how things work. And yet AI bias creeped into this project still. I could have never anticipated it. And to me, this is a really big eye opener and, and, a, and a, an alarm bell about how AI bias can be a huge challenge for humanity. Imagine, you know, situation of discrimination and, you know, you probably remember those horrible episodes with uh, Google and Microsoft networks in the beginning where, you know, pe people, black people were differently classified than white people or, you know, it all depends on the training set uh, that you use to train your network with and if the training set is not balanced like in my case it only contains blue planes that that could have serious serious consequences so AI bias let, let's keep it all in mind um, this was it what are the next steps for you um, here's a few references um, there is a blog post that goes with this talk uh, that's the link um, you can read more about deep learning and convolutional neural networks. I recommend that book uh, called Deep Learning, a Partitioner's Approach uh, from O'Reilly. It's not very new. It's from 2017, but the, the basics, uh, the theory hasn't changed much. Um, and find a fun use case and a data set to experiment with. Um, in that GitHub link, there is the the real code that I use for my model and there is also my planes uh, data set of classified images playing on the bridge or not if you create a network that behaves better than mine I am all ears uh, happy to hear it and my recommendation is think about a use case if you want to experiment that that you know very well uh, maybe maybe at work or uh, I don't know maybe you're a um, uh, you know, maybe you're a tree expert and then you could you could work uh, fun experiment with trees. I think that always, you know, especially with side projects or learning projects, it always helps to to keep the passion a little bit going. And uh, this was it for me. Again, thanks for having me and uh, and thanks for the entire organization. Bye.